Company. Please welcome Garnet Schulhauser. Thank you, Bob, for that wonderful introduction. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today. I am the author of four books in the metaphysical, spiritual genre, Dancing on a Stamp, Dancing Forever with Spirit, Dance of Heavenly Bliss, and Dance of Eternal Rapture. All of my books recount my dialogue and subsequent astral travels with my spirit guide, Albert. On many of my astral trips, I encountered advanced ET races and other human civilizations on distant planets, and we'll be getting into that a little later. Today I will talk about some of the amazing out-of-body adventures I enjoyed with Albert, including encounters with two super-intelligent non-human ET races, a dialogue with Gaia, the consciousness of Mother Earth, a meeting with a blue alien living on Earth disguised as a human, a trip to an advanced civilization governed by women, a visit to utopian civilization on a distant planet, startling revelations about the new Earth and how to make the ascension, and fascinating adventures about Earth in a parallel universe. But before I get into the details of these astro adventures, I would like to give you some background about me and my first encounter with Albert. I grew up in a small farm in Saskatchewan in a very religious Roman Catholic family. After high school, I went to university and eventually ended up in law school. After graduation, I began a corporate law practice in Calgary that lasted for 34 years until I retired. But over the years, my religious upbringing lost much of its influence. And by the time I had reached my 30s, I had rejected many of the beliefs of the church. And I began searching for a new paradigm to latch onto. I constantly asked myself the eternal questions of life. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my life's purpose? And what happens to me when I die? And then one fateful day in 2007, my life was transformed and all of my questions were answered. It happened when I was still practicing law. I was walking down the street one sunny afternoon when a homeless man jumped out of the shadows and stopped me in my tracks. He looked like a typical homeless man with long, greasy hair, a scraggly beard, and dirty, slept-in clothes. But I didn't walk around him like I usually did with people on the street because I was transfixed by the gaze from his dazzling, sparkling blue eyes that penetrated into the depths of my soul, and at the same time sending me a wave of pure, unconditional love that was infusing my whole body with an amazing sense of peace and security. So I stood there like a deer caught in the headlights. I don't know how long it was. It was like I was in a time warp. Finally, Albert broke the spell that, that I found out later his name was Albert. This homeless man broke the spell by saying, why are you here, before disappearing into a nearby store. When I finally collected my wits, I went into the store to find him, but he was nowhere to be seen. So I went out into the street and searched up and down for several blocks trying to find him, but he had disappeared into thin air. The next day, at the same time, I went back to the same street to search for this homeless man, and I finally spotted him sitting all alone on a bench. When I asked him who he was and why he had stopped me the other day, he told me that he was a soul just like me, and he was here to answer my questions and help me on my journey. And then my skeptical lawyer brain kicked in, and I said to him, how do you think you can help me when you can't even help yourself? Because you look like you've been sleeping on the street for weeks and you smell like a dead fish. Well, the homeless man just gave me a big smile and he said, you know, looks can be deceiving because you look like you're a very successful corporate lawyer with everything under control. But we both know that's just a facade. 
He said you can go back to your office and see if you can find all those answers you've been seeking on all those emails waiting for you on your computer, or you can sit down and have a chat with me. Fortunately, my intuition screamed at me that I had to sit down and have a chat with this man. After all, what did I have to lose? A half an hour out of my day? So I sat down and began a dialogue with him that went off and on for several months. And I found out his name was Albert, and he was really one of my spirit guides in disguise. Albert manifested himself as the homeless man for our first three encounters. And after that, he was just a voice in my head as we communicated by telepathy. And when I asked Albert, why did he manifest himself as the homeless man initially? He said, well, if I had suddenly started talking to you as a voice in your head, you probably would have thought you were losing your mind. So I decided to break, break it into you gently by showing up as a homeless man. Well, Albert proved to be a very wise and compassionate spirit. He had a great sense of humor and was not above chiding me for my many human foibles. But he did not lecture or preach to me, and we chatted together like two friends having a, a chat over a beer. He told me early, early on that I was chosen to be one of his messengers, and he wanted me to write a book about his revelations so they would be available to everyone. I was reluctant at first to do so because I had never even dreamed of writing a book. But after some gentle persuasion from Albert, I wrote the manuscript for my first book, Dancing on a Stamp, which was published in 2012. During the course of our dialogue, Albert disclosed many startling new revelations about life, death, the afterlife, and the existence of alien and human civilizations on other planets. With respect to the cycle of reincarnation, Albert revealed that we are all eternal souls whose natural home is on the spirit side, which is a wonderful place where there is no suffering or pain and no negative emotions. We freely chose to incarnate on Earth, which exists in the denser planes of the universe, in order to learn the lessons we need to grow and evolve as souls. Before we incarnated, we each made a life plan, which sets out the significant aspects of our proposed new lives, including the place of our birth and the identity of our parents, siblings, and other relatives. But because we are not allowed to remember our life plan, and because we have free will to act on Earth, we will often stray off course. But Albert assures us that no matter what we do during our lives, we will always return to the spirit side when our physical bodies perish. Regarding extraterrestrial life, Albert disclosed that there are billions and billions of life forms in the universe, some of which are much more intelligent and more technologically advanced than humans. Many of the advanced races have visited our planet since the early days, and they continue to do so. Their spacecraft are usually undetectable by humans because of their cloaking devices, but sometimes they are spotted as UFOs. The ETs deliberately reveal some of their spacecraft to humans to prepare us for the time which will come when they will make direct and open contact with all humans. And Albert reassures me that all the ETs who have visited Earth are all benevolent and they mean us no harm. And during my, the course of my astral travels, I also learned that all the advanced peace-loving races in the galaxy belong to the Galactic Federation, which monitors aggressive and barbaric civilizations to ensure that they cannot export their violence to other planets. Because of the rules established by the Federation, which are much like the prime directive in Star Trek, the advanced races are not allowed to unduly interfere with the development of inferior races. But they are allowed to prevent malevolent races from traveling to other star systems to wage war. Although they generally cannot unduly interfere with the events on Earth, they, they have helped us improve our technology in subtle ways, and they continue to do so. The secret, according to Albert, the secret to interstellar travel is a warp drive 
that creates an artificial wormhole around a ship that causes a warp or fold in the space-time continuum. And he says that when a civilization first develops a warp drive, the Federation will check it out to ensure that they will not use it to wage war on other planets. If necessary, they will disable the warp drives of violent races to keep them from traveling to other star systems. These revelations may be startling to many humans, but they reflect the stark reality of the cycle of reincarnation on Earth and our place in the universe. Furthermore, Albert tells us that the cycle of reincarnation doesn't just apply to humans, but to all the animals on our planet and to the many different life forms that exist on the other planets. This means that souls can choose to incarnate as animals on Earth or as an ET on another planet as part of their journey on the denser planes. And the good news is that souls don't have any timetables or deadlines to meet. They can choose their own path for evolution and their own timetable. Souls can reincarnate on Earth or on another planet as many times as they like until they feel they no longer need to have a journey in a physical body in order to advance. This is possible because linear time with a past, a present, and a future is just an illusion on the earth plane. The reality is that the past and the future do not exist. We only have the present moment. And that concept is difficult for many humans to fully comprehend. Well, since publishing my first book, many people have asked me what Albert is really like. I can tell you he doesn't have wings sprouting from his shoulders and he doesn't have a halo over his head. In fact, he looks very much like an ordinary homeless man. Although he was always wise and compassionate, at times he was cheeky and flippant and a bit of a rascal. He liked to tease me about my many human foibles and he often poked fun at me about some of the hilarious things I did when I was practicing law. His favorite story was about the time in my early days when I occasionally went to court. In this case, I was the sole lawyer for a man in a case against a large insurance company which had two lawyers at the trial. Despite arguing the case as best I could, we lost. As we were leaving the courthouse, my client said to me, I know why we lost. And I said, oh, why? He said, you see, when the other lawyer was up talking, his colleague was sitting beside him thinking. But when you were talking, there was no one thinking. <laughs> My second, third, and fourth books, Dancing Forever with Spirit, Dance of Heavenly Bliss, and Dance of Eternal Rapture, describe my next series of encounters with Albert. They began when I woke up one night and saw this ghost-like, ethereal figure standing in the doorway of my bedroom. When I got closer, I could see it was Albert in astral form. Albert told, told me he came to take me on a series of out-of-body adventures to the spirit side and to other parts of the universe so I could write about what I saw and what I heard in my books, because he believed a picture was worth a thousand words. So with Albert as my tour guide, I got to explore the spirit side and many other fascinating places in the universe. On my first trip to the spirit side, Albert took me to a beautiful white city called Aglaia. We entered the city through its main entrance portal and strolled down the main boulevard. The streets were swarming with souls dressed in colorful garments from many different countries and eras on Earth and I felt like I'd been dropped into the middle of a costume ball. Albert explained that souls can appear to others in any form they choose, and often they will appear in the clothing they enjoyed wearing from one of their lifetimes on Earth, or they can just appear as a globe of light. But no matter what appearance souls choose to display to others, we can always recognize them because they each have a unique energy signature. Eventually, we came to a majestic building with pillars lining the front. 
which Albert called the Hall of Wisdom, where we entered a large circular chamber with a high domed ceiling. In the middle of a room was a table in the shape of a horseshoe with 11 regal souls seated behind it, all with snow white hair and smooth, unwrinkled skin. Albert told me this group was called the Council of Wise Ones, a group of very wise and advanced souls whose job it was to oversee all the incarnations on earth. The chair of the council, Sophia, had a message for me to convey to all humans. She said that humanity was at a crucial crossroads. We have progressed a lot since the early days, but our emotional and spiritual intelligence has not kept pace with our technological achievements. She said we let our negative emotions, like fear, anger, hate, and greed, rule too much of our lives, and this results in violence and conflict. She noted that humans have weapons of mass destruction that could destroy all life on the planet, and we must work hard to avoid destroying our civilization like some of the other advanced civilizations in our history, such as Atlantis and Lemuria, and several others we have not yet even discovered. Humans must strive to discard their negative emotions and embrace love, which will enable them to expand their consciousness and raise their vibrations so they can ascend to Earth in a higher dimension, also known as the New Earth. She told me I was one of their messengers and Albert would take me on several astral trips so I could write about his revelations in my books. On one of my trips, Albert took me to a cavern under the North Pole, where I had a conversation with Gaia, the consciousness of Mother Earth. Gaia is the life force of our beautiful planet, the sum total of all rivers, lakes, oceans, rocks, and deserts that make up the planet which is known as the third rock from the sun. Gaia is fiercely protected of her flora and fauna and is very distressed at the abuse that humans inflict on Mother Earth and all of her creatures. She voiced her dismay at the way humans dump their garbage into her rivers and oceans, spill toxic chemicals onto her soil, and poison her atmosphere with noxious fumes. Gaia cannot understand why humans are so destructive to their environment, which is detrimental to their health and is often disastrous to her other creatures. She advised that she was trying to raise her vibrations so she could rise up to a higher dimension, abundant with love and compassion, but the negativity of humans was holding her back. Gaia says she speaks to humans every day through the sounds of nature the rustle of leaves in the breeze, the babbling of a brook in the forest, the crashing of the surf on a rocky beach, but most humans do not hear her message because they are too busy chasing money and power. She sincerely hoped that humans will curtail their abuse and learn to live in peaceful harmony with Mother Earth and the creatures who share our planet. So we can all ascend to enjoy the love and splendor of a higher dimension. As Albert left the cavern, I expressed my surprise that our planet had a consciousness. Albert told me that Gaia has many surprises up her sleeve, and he agreed to show me a few of her secrets. To make his point, Albert next took me to a forest in the Pacific Northwest of America, where he introduced me to one of Earth's fabled creatures, a Sasquatch named Xana. She was around nine feet tall, with an ape-like head and a muscular body covered in dark brown hair. Xana told me that her species originated in Africa eons ago when a now extinct primate was inseminated with the sperm from a humanoid ET. The Sasquatch have secretly coexisted for centuries with humans on all the continents except Antarctica and have been known by many different names such as Bigfoot, Yeti, and the abominable snowman. They've been very careful to avoid contact with humans because they view us to be violent and aggressive. And they feared that if they made contact with humans, they would be poked and prodded in our labs or displayed as circus freaks. 
I learned that Zana and her kin are sensitive and intelligent beings who communicate by telepathy and live in harmony with Mother Earth and all her creatures. They have an animal sensitive radar that allows them to detect humans from several miles away, which allows them to avoid detection. They have rejected developing technology in favor of living close to nature. Her parting wish was for humans to stop their violence and aggression so they could live in peaceful coexistence with the Sasquatch. Well, I was deeply touched by the predicament of Zana and her race, who were forced to hide in underground caves to escape human contact. I hoped that someday they would feel comfortable living openly among us. Well, as we left the forest where I had met Zana, I asked Albert to explain the difference between a Bigfoot and a human. Albert said, oh, that's easy. One has thick matted hair and smells awful, and the other has big feet. <laughs> so much for trying to get a straight answer out of Albert. But when Albert got back on track, I found out that he was not finished with his surprises as he led me across the Atlantic to the green countryside of Ireland. In a secluded meadow, Albert introduced me to one of the fabled little people of the Emerald Isle, a fairy named Brina. She was a beautiful little person, about three feet tall, who looked like a tiny, perfect china doll. Brina told me that fairies had once roamed freely in Ireland, living a peaceful and harmonious existence with nature. But, that hall, but they had been forced to hide in underground cities after humans arrived on the island. At first they thought that humans were just larger versions of themselves, and they welcomed us with open arms. But they soon found out that humans were a violent and belligerent race who had to be avoided at all costs. And so they've been hiding in underground cities ever since, spotted by humans only on rare occasions. They are afraid of humans, but they won't use violence to get rid of us because of their peace-loving nature. Like the Sasquatch, they hope that one day, when humans finally see the light, they will be able to come out of hiding and once again frolic in the sunlight. And then to demonstrate that the universe is full of surprises, Albert took me on a trip to a planet many light years from Earth. It was a beautiful water planet called Proteus, which looked much like Earth, except it had low, no land masses. We dropped down through the clouds and submerged into the clear blue waters, where the plants and sea life reminded me of life beneath the oceans of Earth. Albert led me towards a large coral reef, where we met with two creatures that looked like a humpback whale and a dolphin. These creatures tell me they look familiar because most of the sea life on Earth had been seeded from life on Proteus with the help of the advanced ET races in the galaxy. They told me they kept in telepathic contact with the dolphins and whales on Earth and they did not like what they heard. They asserted that the dolphins and whales on Earth are highly intelligent beings who want to live in harmony with all the creatures on their planet, including humans, and they cannot understand why humans continue to abuse them without justification. I promised to take their message back to my fellow humans on Earth. And then to reinforce the, the message I'd been given by the cetaceans on Proteus, Albert took me back to Earth to meet with one of our own dolphins. On a small island in Bahamas, I was delighted to meet Shimmers, the dolphin, who spoke to me by telepathy. She was highly intelligent, spiritually advanced creature who communicated with her kin and all other cetaceans by telepathy. She wanted all humans to understand that they are sensitive beings with feelings and emotions just like humans, and they truly want to live in harmony with the human race. They love our beautiful planet and respect all of her other creatures, and they do not pollute Mother Earth because they honor her for all the gifts that she bestows on them every day. They understand that the creatures on our planet have their own special place in the universe, and they should be allowed to live their lives according to their own agendas 
without interference from humans. Dolphins are in tune with spirit as they fully understand their connection to each other and to everything else in the universe. They feel that life would be much more pleasant for all creatures if humans did not interfere with the natural cycle of life on our planet. They lament that humans are like an invasive, out-of-control weed that is spreading its deadly tentacles around the globe, snuffing out all, all other life in its path. In their view, humans are violent, aggressive, and disrespectful of their planet and all of its creatures. From their perspective, humans are truly a sight to behold, a barbaric race of aggressive and brutal creatures that has managed somehow to develop technology that allows them to dominate our world to the detriment of everything else. But they have recently noticed more and more humans becoming spiritually aware. And these enlightened people are leading the way toward a kinder and gentler interface with their planet and all of its creatures. They sincerely hope that these spiritually enlightened humans will step up their efforts to encourage others to espouse love and kindness for everyone and everything on the planet. It must be a concerted effort to pierce the darkness with their beacons of light. And someday we may all once again enjoy paradise on earth. I was pleasantly surprised to learn that I could communicate with shimmers when I was in astral form. And I hoped that one day all humans could hear what dolphins had to say so we could treat them with the dignity and respect that they deserved. Well, even though the plight of dolphins and whales on Earth is a very serious matter, every time I see a whale on TV, I can't help but remember a funny story from my youth. It happened when I was in the first grade, and our teacher, Miss Prentice, was teaching the class about whales. When she had finished, she asked if anyone had questions. Immediately, one of the girls in the class put up her hand and said, do whales swallow people? Miss Prentice shook her head and said, no, whales cannot swallow people because they have throat pleats that filter out their food of plankton and krill. But my classmate persisted. She said, but our Sunday school teacher told us that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. Miss Prentice was getting flustered and she sputtered, I told you, whales cannot swallow people. But the little girl was not satisfied, so she said, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jonah if he was really swallowed by a whale. By now, Miss Prentice was angry, and she retorted, what if Jonah went to hell? Without missing a beat, the little girl said, well, in that case, you can ask him. I soon found out that Albert wasn't finished with his surprises as he next took me to a planet near the center of our galaxy. Xeron was a barren planet without any vegetation on the surface, but beneath the surface it was home to a race of super-intelligent spider-like creatures. Their job is to monitor planets in the galaxy to look for uh, planets that, that can harbor life. Eons ago, they discovered that Earth was ready to host life, and they organized other ET races to seed our planet with life from other worlds. They began with primitive life forms on Earth and gradually moved on up to humans. Thanks to the benevolence race and the other ETs who did the seeding, we can all enjoy the diversity of life on our planet. So when I pressed Albert for more information about the ETs, Albert said that there were numerous intelligent races in our galaxy, many of which had very advanced technology and the ability to travel between the stars. To prove his point, Albert took me to visit an ET spacecraft that was orbiting the Earth. Inside this gleaming ship, I encountered humanoid beings with gray skin, hairless heads, and large oblong eyes. They advised that their race had been seeding life on Earth since the early days, at the direction of the Galactic Council, which is the governing body of all the advanced civilizations in our galaxy. They cannot directly interfere with events on Earth because of the previous mentioned 
uh, Star Trek-like directive, and hence they've had to watch other advanced civilizations like Atlantis and Lemuria crash and burn. But they have been able to help humans advance in subtle ways by telepathically providing knowledge and technological insights to humans whenever possible. They are very concerned that humans have once again reached a transition point where we either move up the vibratory ladder or crash and burn. Albert said this race was only one of many advanced races of ETs who've been monitoring our planet for eons. And the spacecraft I visited was one of the many different UFOs that have been sighted by humans over the ages. Albert confirmed again to me that the ETs who have visited Earth from time to time are all benevolent creatures <clears throat> who did not in any way endanger humans on the planet we call home. Albert went on to explain that sometimes ETs actually live among us undetected. And to demonstrate his point, he took me to the University of Oxford in England. We touched down near the John Ratcliffe Hospital and waited near the front door. Soon I noticed a pert, neatly dressed lady in her 50s leaving the entrance with a brown paper bag in her head and finally settling down in the shade to eat her lunch. Albert said this lady was a professor at the medical school teaching classes in neuroscience. He said she was not a human, but a member of an ET race from a planet many light years from Earth. She had been planted here nine years before, disguised as a human, and her human name was Amanda. Her ET race had been visiting and monitoring life on Earth for many years, and sometimes we created human disguises to allow them to live among humans without being detected. This allowed them to mo more closely observe human behavior patterns so they could better understand how we functioned. Then Albert waved his hand over Amanda and her human facade slowly disappeared, allowing me to see her in her natural state. She was a blue humanoid creature with large bald head and shiny black eyes. She had arms and legs similar to humans, except she had five fingers and a thumb on each hand. She looked to be around six feet tall and wore a silver metallic jumpsuit that glittered in the sunlight. As soon as she was revealed to me, she smiled and spoke to us by telepathy. She said her race was very, has very advanced technology that is light years beyond human technology. They've been traveling among the stars for thousands of years and have learned how to create realistic 3D holographic projections that allow them to masquerade as anything they choose. She said she has a small holographic projector implanted in her chest that she controls by her thoughts. When humans see her as Amanda, they're actually viewing her very lifelike human disguise, an illusion complete with all of the physical attributes of a homo sapien. Her disguise was so sophisticated that no humans could detect her true identity. She said that living among humans allows them to get an intimate perspective on what makes us tick, so they can understand what motivates humans and what triggers their negative emotions. She noted that humans on Earth stand out among all the intelligent races in the galaxy because of our propensity to inflict abuse on one another, something that seldom happens with other intelligent races in the Milky Way. Toxic emotions are unique to humans on Earth and they are trying to determine the cause so they can find a way to suppress these feelings. They are doing this to help our civilization curb its abusive behavior before we end up destroying ourselves. This is why she teaches at the medical school in Oxford, because it allows her to explore the workings of the human brain as part of her research without raising suspicions from the other staff. She advised that there were many others from her race who were engaged in similar activities throughout our planet, and she sincerely hoped that they would find a solution before it was too late. She then morphed back to her Amanda disguise and returned to the hospital. And then to reinforce his point that ETs have been affecting us in subtle ways during our history, Albert took me to the Akashic Records, 
which contain the records of every life that has ever been lived on the universe. And there he showed me scenes from a, a, a life that I lived as a, a Druid priest where I had a very close encounter with an ET. Albert showed me some scenes from that past life as a Druid priest where I was living on the Salisbury Plain in England around 3000 BC. I watched as a starship landed nearby, manned by an eight-foot human called Mogons, who came from a civilization living on a planet in the Andromeda constellation. Mogons enlisted my help to organize the villagers to build a cosmic beacon he needed to provide navigational guidance for ships in warp drive. With the aid of laser cutting tools and anti-gravity wands supplied by Mogons, special stones were queried and transported to the plane to build the structure now known as Stonehenge. When the stones were all in place in accordance with the detailed plans supplied by Mogons, he placed a power box in the center of the structure and left in his spaceship. Mogon said that someday his people would make open contact with humans on Earth, only when the humans on Earth had learned to curb their violent ways. Years later, he returned unnoticed to retrieve the power box when the beacon was no longer needed. And the natives never discovered the true purpose for Stonehenge, and for many years, they used it for religious purposes. Well, that certainly explained how those massive stones were cut with precision and transported over many miles by primitive humans. There's nothing like a little help from our friends who travel between the stars. Albert then provided me with another example of how ETs have helped life on Earth in subtle ways. He told me that eons ago, another moon, larger than our current moon, circled Earth in a higher orbit. He said it was truly a stunning display from Earth to see the night sky filled with both moons. The larger moon had an atmosphere and climatic conditions very similar to Earth, with many different life forms that thrived in this congenial habitat, including a large species of large flightless birds, several different types of small mammals, and a variety of insects. It was a nicely balanced ecosystem where all the inhabitants enjoyed the freedom to live without interference from a more advanced race. But then, long before recorded history on Earth, disaster struck when a large comet smashed into this moon, knocking it into a trajectory away from the sun. The collision triggered a series of earthquakes and volcanoes, which caused it to break into pieces. Several of the trunks crashed into Mars and Jupiter, and the bulk of them ended up in an orbit around the Sun in what is now known as the asteroid belt. <clears throat> Just before the collision, one of the ET races that had been monitoring activity on Earth loaded their spacecraft with a few specimens of each life form and flew them to safety on Earth. They landed in the area now known as Australia when it was still part of the supercontinent of Gondwana. The rescued creatures were left to make a life for themselves in a place that resembled their old home in many respects. The large birds, now known as emus, thrived in their new home, as did many of the small animals still living in Australia today, but nowhere else. These mammals were mainly marsupials, including kangaroos, wallabies, koalas, and opossums, as well as, <coughs> excuse me, as, as well as mammals that lay eggs, like the duck-billed platypus and the spiny anteater. When I asked Albert why the ETs hadn't used their superior technology to prevent the collision that broke up the other moon, he said that they were bound by the directive of the Galactic Council, <coughs> preventing them from interfering with the normal course of cosmic events. But they were, were allowed to rescue life forms from doomed habitats and relocate them to other planets with compatible atmospheres and climates. They chose Australia as a new home for these creatures, partly due to the fact that Australia had a climate very similar to the moon where they came from, but mainly because it was home to Uluru, previously known as Ayers Rock, 
which is the famous sandstone monolith in the Northern Territory's Red Central Desert. The ETs unloaded their precious cargo close to Uluru so that these creatures would be able to easily connect with Gaia as part of their orientation to planet Earth. Albert pointed out that Uluru was, and still is, one of Gaia's communications beacons that transmits subliminal messages to her fauna by the modulation of energy waves passing through this rock. Creatures who turn into this, these ethereal vibrations feel an intimate connection to Mother Earth and the ETs hoped that this would help the transplanted creatures become comfortable in their new surroundings. A few humans who visit Uluru sense there is something special about this monolith, and the Aboriginal people who have lived near this rock for centuries have a unique spiritual connection with this massive block of sandstone, which they regard as a sacred site. Only those people with pure hearts and quiet, uncluttered minds can hear the whispers emanating from Gaia like a stream of divine consciousness. Albert said it is a pity that all humans aren't able to perceive the true nature of this beacon and feel the love and compassion that Gaia showers on all of her creatures. Maybe then humankind would change its ways and treat one another and all the other inhabitants of our beautiful planet with dignity and respect. So then Albert decided to reveal some significant ET counters in more recent times. And he, and, and he introduced me to the soul who enjoyed his last incarnation on Earth as Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon. I was thrilled when I got to meet one of my childhood heroes, Neil Armstrong, who passed from the Earth plane in 2012. I was fascinated when Neil disclosed that shortly after they touched down on the moon, he had telepathic contact with an ET named Lassa from the planet Selene. Lassa told Neil that they had a concealed base on the far side of the moon as part of their mandate to observe the activities on Earth. And she cautioned him not to mention this contact to Buzz Aldrin or Mission Control because they would think he was losing his mind. Then to confirm to Neil that he was not just imagining things, when he first stepped on the surface of the moon, he saw a message written in the dust. It said, welcome to the moon, Neil Armstrong, which he quickly erased with his boot before Buzz arrived. Neil told me that he never mentioned any of this during his life on Earth for fear of being ridiculed, which would have left a smear on his very distinguished career. It really is too bad that people on our planet are so quick to ridicule individuals who reveal contracts with ETs, because it means that there are likely thousands of similar stories that remain untold. Well, Neil was certainly a fascinating guy to talk to, and before we parted, he told me a funny story he had heard about the European Space Agency. It seems that the European Space Agency, or the ESA, recruited one Dutch man, one French man, and the Marlboro man for a mission. As the mission would last 10 years, they asked the astronauts what they would like to bring with them into space. The Dutch guy says, I would like to master a new language. Can I bring a Spanish teacher? So the ESA recruits the best Spanish teacher available and sends her to space with the others. Well, the Frenchman says, I love my wife and I can't live without her for 10 years. So the ESA trains his wife and sends her into space as well. Then the Marlboro man says, I'm a big smoker and I can't go without cigarettes for 10 years. So the ESA uses cutting edge technology to build a smoking chamber in the station and fills it with enough cigarettes for 10 years. Well, 10 years pass, the mission is successful and the astronauts return to Earth. First, the Dutchman steps off and he says, hola, with a perfect Spanish accent. Everyone applauds the astronaut's double achievement. Then the Frenchman and his wife step off, followed by two little children. The crowd applauds like crazy 
as they had two kids in space. Finally, the Marlboro man steps off with a cigarette in his mouth, shaking and visibly traumatized. He looks around at the crowd and says, does anyone have a light? <laughs> By now, it was obvious to me that ET races were everywhere in our galaxy. But I was curious about other human civilizations. The Stonehenge ET was a human, but I wondered if there were other human communities elsewhere in the Milky Way. Albert assured me there were other human civilizations thriving in our galaxy, some of which were much more advanced than humans on Earth. And he took me on an astral trip to see a couple of them firsthand. Albert guided me on a trip to a planet called Thrasso, many light years from Earth. As we touched down on the surface, I noticed that this planet had a very advanced human civilization with ultra-modern cities, flying cars, and moving walkways. The Imperial Palace was where we met with Empress Marpesia, who had been elected as the supreme leader by the popular vote of the women in our society. Marpesia explained that they enjoyed a matriarchal society ruled solely by women and the men were not allowed to vote or hold any position of power or authority. The men were all docile and submissive because of their very low testosterone levels, which resulted from the chemical sterilization of all children, all males rather, at the age of three. But Marpesia asserted that their men were not subjugated or treated harshly, as they were free to pursue sports and recreational activities and just enjoy life. They did not miss their sex drive because they never remembered having it. There were no crime or conflicts in their society as the women were always able to reconcile their differences peacefully and the men caused no problems because they were always deferential and compliant. Women and men did not form partnerships or have sex <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> and their babies were artificially inseminated using sperm from the sperm bank that was supplied by a few chosen males who had not been sterilized. Marpesa explained that long ago they had been a patriarchal society where the women had been subjugated by violent and aggressive men. But this all changed one day when a woman discovered a plant that drastically reduced the testosterone level in men and they have lived in peaceful harmony ever since. Well, that was certainly one way to run a planet, although I wondered if there wasn't some happy middle ground between the extremes of this matriarchal society and the male-dominated world of my own planet. It would be wonderful if we could achieve true equality in all respects for men and women on our planet, even though we will always have some inherent differences due to our propensity to be influenced by left brain or right brain thinking. An example of the cognitive differences between men and women came to light recently when I noticed a humorous post on Facebook. It obviously came from a man who felt his wife had nagged him too often about fixing things around the house. The post said, when a man says he will do something, he will do it, and there's no need to remind him every six months. As, as we left Thrasso in its matriarchal society, I asked Albert if this civilization had ever visited our planet. He told me they had not done so because they had not yet mastered the ability to travel between the stars. Thank God, I said to myself. I was afraid I'd have to hurry back to Earth to warn the men, lest we all end up singing like the Vienna Boys Choir. Fortunately for me, my next trip with Albert took me to a utopian human civilization living on the planet Gamma, many light years from Earth, where men and women were equal in all respects. As we descended toward the surface of Gamma, Albert told me it was home to a super-intelligent race of humans who had developed very advanced technology, including spacecraft that could travel between the stars. He wanted me to see another example of a human civilization that had managed to thrive by overcoming 
the destructive tendencies that have plagued humans on Earth for so many years. The citizens on, looked like humans on Earth, with a variety of hair colors and skin tones scattered among the throngs. They appeared to be healthy and happy, chatting amiably as they went about their business. Albert introduced me then to one of their citizens, a woman named Jophiel. She confirmed that they are humans, just like the ones on planet Earth, except their civilization is very different from the one on Earth. Her civilization was at the same stage as Earth's eons ago, but they had managed to struggle through the challenges they faced, and they now thrive in a happy and peaceful society. In the early days of their civilization, they were brutal and aggressive, like people on Earth, and they suffered through many wars and savage conflicts. And then their scientists discovered that the cruel and aggressive people suffered from a common defective gene, and they were able to gradually rid their population from this affliction through genetic engineering and selective breeding. Now they have no violence or crime, and they live their lives in peaceful harmony with one another, and men and women are equal in all respects. Because their technology is very advanced, they all enjoy everything they need for a happy and fulfilled life, all courtesy of their collective, which supplies all the food, shelter, recreation, and entertainment they require. Their people don't have to work for a living, and they don't have any need for money. Their education is provided for by the collective, and their people are free to pursue their interest in any one of many career paths available on their planet. Joe Field said they all cheerfully pitch in to support the collective to the best of their abilities, but there is no hierarchy or pecking order. They are all equal citizens of their planet, and no one gets special treatment. As a result, there is no jealousy, greed, or competition among their people, and crime is non-existent. All the people in the city were robust, fit, and healthy. This was a result of their genetic engineering, which eliminated all the genes that previously made them susceptible to disease, physical handicaps, and the natural aging process. So now they can live for hundreds of years without any physical deterioration of their bodies. In fact, unless they perish in a natural accident on their planet or when they are exploring the galaxy, they die when they feel it is time to move on by enters, entering special departure chambers that vaporize their bodies and allow their souls to return to spirit. All their people were perfectly proportioned with no excess body fat, thanks to a miracle diet pill developed many years ago. This pill allowed them to consume as much food as they like without any concern about calories or cholesterol. Although they could provide healthy sustenance for their citizens in the form of liquid food, they learned long ago that they truly, eat, they truly enjoy eating a variety of tasty food dishes. So they manufacture food without killing any of the animals on their planet that is indistinguishable from the food they used to make from animal flesh. And by ingesting the diet pill, they can eat whatever they want without gaining any weight. They have hundreds of restaurants in the city where they gather nightly to eat and drink to their heart's content. It sounded to me like an idyllic society, and I wondered if our civilization on Earth could reach these lofty heights before we crashed and burned. Albert said it was doable, but it would take a concerted effort by all humans on Earth to create this heaven on Earth. My trip to Gamma gave me new hope that one day our human civilization on Earth could create its own utopia. I feel strongly that we can achieve this if we all pull together. By now, you must be thinking that all of my astral trips with Albert were exciting and awe-inspiring. But I want to tell you about one of these excursions that was hellish and frightening, when Albert took me to the center of a black hole. As you know, astronomers tell us that black holes are usually created when a star collapses on itself, leaving a core of extremely dense matter that has such a strong gravitational pull that nothing not even light, can escape from its clutches. 
I'm not sure why Albert took me there. And as I submerged down into the core of this black hole, I experienced something I'd never ever encountered before. Total sensory deprivation and total isolation. I could not see, hear, or feel anything. I was enveloped in absolute blackness, and I had no sense of passing time. Albert had seemingly disappeared, and I was all alone in this terrifying pit of darkness and despair, with no way to escape. I felt the panic welling up in my chest as I began to think that I was in hell and I might be stuck in this accursed netherworld forever. But then to my relief, I noticed a tiny pinprick of light in the distance. As the light got bigger as it approached, and soon it engulfed me and shut out the darkness. I found myself in a strange world that reminded me of the diagram of an atom I had studied in school. It was a round mass in the center of a globe with sparks of light revolving around it much like the nucleus of an atom surrounded by orbiting electrons. Soon, an invisible force caused me to zoom away from this atom, and I noticed other atoms had clumped together with it to form a molecule. As I continued to zoom away, I could see that this molecule had combined with other similar molecules to form a shiny black substance that sparkled in the light. Then I found myself slowly emerging from the glass eye of a teddy bear sitting in a shelf in my family room. I noticed that Albert was now standing beside me, grinning from ear to ear. As he assured me, he had been with me all along, and I had spent less than 30 seconds of Earth time in the black hole. He told me he had deliberately concealed his presence so I could experience the sadness of being all alone. When I asked him how I had managed to end up back in my home, Albert pointed out that the space-time continuum is curved in many different ways, and I had returned through an interdimensional wormhole. Albert wanted me to understand that you can't truly appreciate the light until you have experienced total darkness. And he was right. After my trip to the black hole, I realized how fortunate I was to be able to see and truly appreciate the splendor of the sunrise, the breathtaking beauty of the flowers in my garden, and the majesty of the sequoia tree towering above our home. And then to cheer me up after that terrifying trip to the black hole, Albert took me to visit Earth in a higher dimension, often referred to as 5D Earth or the New Earth. We passed through an interdimensional doorway to reach the new Earth, which exists simultaneously with our Earth, but at a much higher vibration rate. There I met with the descendants of a human civilization that had originally lived in Central America. This civilization had lived in peace and harmony with each other, with Mother Earth, and with the other creatures who shared our planet. But in the face of a barbarian human army, encroaching on their territory, their leaders had orchestrated a mass ascension to the new earth where they now live with their descendants in peace and harmony. The citizens of the new earth are not plagued by negative emotions like fear, anger, hate, and greed, and they are rampant, that emotions are that are rampant on the old earth. As a result, they have no violence or crime and they live in total harmony with their planet and its other creatures. They do not consume animal flesh and eat only liquid nourishment made from plants. They have learned to shield themselves from disease, to repair injured tissue, and to slow down the aging process, so they live for several hundred years. They do not have to work, and they have no need for money. Everything they need is provided for by their society. Well, this is truly an idyllic society that we should all aspire to reach. Well, the new earth was an amazing place indeed, so I asked Albert how someone on the old earth could ascend to the new earth. Albert told me that on many occasions, humans on the old earth have in fact made the ascension to the new earth by raising their vibrations high enough 
to match the vibrations of the new earth. Humans can raise their vibrations by fully embracing love, compassion, and forgiveness, and by stifling their negative emotions. Although many humans have made the ascensions over the years, I asked Albert to introduce me to someone who had accomplished this feat. As a result, Albert introduced me to Bonita, a soul on the spirit side who had made this ascension in her last life on Earth. Bonita had been living happily in Oregon with her husband and two young children when her world fell apart. Her beloved family was killed when a drunk driver ran through a red light and T-boned their vehicle. She was devastated, but her boundless grief soon gave way to anger, and she vented her fury at God. So she blamed herself for, for allowing this to happen, and she blamed God for allowing the tragedy to occur. In her wrath, she vowed to distance herself from this cruel and uncaring deity who had callously robbed all the joy and meaning from her life. She slowly spired down into the bottomless pit of despair and seriously contemplated suicide, despite all of the love and comfort she received from her parents and siblings. And then, in desperation, with nowhere else to go and nothing to lose, she followed some sage advice from a college friend and boarded a plane to Mumbai. She ended up in an ashram in southern India where she began the painful climb out of her personal hell. After a few days, she tuned into the peace and tranquility of the ashram, and her anguish gradually subsided. She had never, been, never before practiced meditation, but she now found much needed solace in the daily group sessions that seemed to resonate with her soul. After a few weeks, she was able to sit quietly by herself for several hours at a time in a deep meditative trance, where she learned to forget the past and focus on life in the present moment. With gentle coaching from her gurus, she found her way out of the darkness into the divine light of spiritual awareness. She no longer wild in anger and despair as she realized these emotions serve no purpose except to drain her energy. Over time, she learned to love and forgive herself and everyone else having a journey on our planet, including the man who had crashed into her family's car. And she even forgave God when she finally realized that God did not cause her loved ones to be taken from her. In her epiphany, she now understood the cycle of reincarnation on Earth and her role as an individual aspect of the Source. And then one afternoon, to her surprise, when she opened her eyes after a deep trance, she found herself in strange surroundings. She had somehow been transported to a bucolic glen where she was greeted warmly by a handsome young man with an engaging smile. She soon found out that she had physically ascended from the old Earth to the new Earth by increasing her vibrations to an elevated rate. She had managed to do this by rejecting all destructive emotions in favor of love and compassion. And once her vibrations matched those of the new Earth, her ascendancy flowed naturally, like water vapor rising from the ocean to form billowing white clouds. She had simply disappeared from the ashram without a trace, although the gurus suspected that she had made her ascension. Bonita's tale should inspire all humans to raise their vibrations so they can make the ascension to the new earth and leave behind the quagmire of negative emotions that permeates the old earth. It was apparent to me after learning about the new earth that our universe consists of countless dimensions having different vibration rates. But I wondered if there were any parallel dimensions or universes with similar vibration rates. Albert confirmed that parallel universes do exist, and they have been around since the beginning of time. When the, force, when the source created the first universe in what some scientists call the Big Bang, it wanted to experience what it had created in all of its facets without guidance or interference. 
So the universe began as an explosion of pure energy that eventually congealed into matter in many different patterns and formations. It was created with a built-in randomness factor to ensure that the ongoing permutations would be limitless. The first universe followed its divine destiny and eventually split into two universes, similar to the way a cell in a human body divides into two identical cells through the process known as mitosis. Although the two universes were identical at first, they soon began to develop on different paths due to the random interaction of their energy and matter. And then at different times in the cosmic cycle, each of these two universes split into two, and so on until we now have countless universes that were all originally spawned from the source. No two universes are identical, although some have much in common, while others are radically different. The differences arose initially due to the small random variations in their flow of energy and the formation of matter, and later subtler dis distinctions resulted from the free will actions of the various life forms that populated the planets. In some universes, Earth does not e even exist due to a quirk in the formation of the solar system. And in others, our planet is radically different from the world that we know it. For example, in one parallel universe, the asteroid that crashed into the Yucatan Peninsula 65 million years ago, killing most of the dinosaurs, missed that Earth by a whisker, and dinosaurs are still the dominant species of that planet. All these universes exist simultaneously in different dimensions, but most life forms, including humans on Earth, cannot detect them except in rare cases. There are, however, very advanced races that can peer into the other universes, and some can even travel between dimensions. This brings to mind the so-called Mandela effect, a concept that is familiar to many of you. The term was coined by a paranormal researcher who discovered that a significant number of participants at a conference in South Africa all had the same memory of media reports that Nelson Mandela had died in prison in the 1980s, in stark contrast with the fact that he had been released from prison in 1990 and went on to become president of that country. A number of explanations have been advanced for this phenomena, but the reality, according to Albert, is that these people had a glimpse of Earth in a parallel universe where the events they remembered about Mandela were actually true. Albert says that sometimes windows to other dimensions will temporarily open up, allowing some people to view the events in another dimension that often have significant differences from our own dimension. And to make his point, Albert took me on an astral trip to visit Earth in another dimension. He led me through an interdimensional doorway floating in space high above our planet. On the other side, we hovered momentarily above a blue orb that looked like Earth before we plunged down through the clouds on our way to New York City. When we landed in lower Manhattan, I was surprised to see the World Trade Towers still standing intact. Just as I remembered them from one of my visits to that city prior to September 11, 2001. Albert explained that this was the same year in this universe as in our world, and the World Trade Towers were still standing because they had not been destroyed in a terrorist attack in 2001, due to the fact that there were no Islamic terrorists in this world. In fact, Islam as a religion did not exist anywhere on this planet. This is because Muhammad died at a young age before he was able to engender the religion that currently plays a major role in the world affairs on Earth. As a result, the Middle Eastern countries on this planet were mostly Christian and there were no jihadists anywhere. He pointed out a number of significant differences that arose from this one seminal event. The Crusades did not happen because the Holy Land was occupied by Christians, not infidels. 
The state of Israel did not exist in the territory occupied by Israel, Lebanon, Syria, and the Sinai Peninsula in our world comprise the country of Palestine in this world, which is populated by Jews and Christian Arabs who live in peaceful coexistence. There was no civil war going on in the lands that comprise our Syria, and ISIS never existed. And then to demonstrate another significant difference, Albert took me north to the heart of Harlem. When I asked him why there were so few African Americans on the streets, he said it resulted from another noteworthy event on this planet that never happened on our planet. <clears throat> Early in the 16th century, England abolished slavery, and the rest of Europe followed suit. And because the colonies in North America were governed by England and other European nations, slavery was also abolished in the New World. This meant that no slaves were captured in Africa and transported to America. As a result, African Americans who emigrated here in the normal course represented less than 1% of the population of the United States rather than the 13% in our world and they were scattered over the whole country. President Lincoln did not issue the Emancipation Proclamation because there were no slaves to free and the Civil War never happened. There was no need for the Civil Rights Movement and Martin Luther King was not born in this country. There was no such thing as the Confederate flag or the Ku Klux Klan. I was truly astounded at how a couple of seemingly minor quirks in the history of this earth had such a major development on the, the affairs in that planet. Well, my astral trips with Albert clearly opened my eyes to the vastness and diversity of life in our universe. But when I asked Albert to explain how this all came about and what, and what was my role in the grand scheme of things, he responded by taking me to visit a very wise entity who had all the answers. In a deep, dark cave on the spirit side, I encountered Eloa, the voice of the source, who appeared as a ball of fire suspended in midair with yellow and orange flames dancing about in a dazzling display of brilliance. He explained that it, it was his joyful duty to reach out to souls who desire to commun communicate with the creator of the universe, which is why Albert brought me to this cave. I asked them about the true nature of the source and about the creation of the universe. He told me that the source is the totality of everything in the universe. All things, whether animate or inanimate, are intimately connected to the source and form part of its divine oneness. No one created the source. It always was and always will be. This will be difficult for humans to comprehend because we must deal with the limitations of our human minds. The source gave birth to the universe so it could enjoy the splendor of what it was, a way to augment its self-awareness by admiring the ineffable beauty of the limitless cosmos it had spawned in that glorious moment of divine self-actualization. The source is the master architect of our vast cosmos the prime mover of everything that exists in our observable universe and all things beyond. The source is the fountainhead of all love in the universe, and it projects unconditional love to all things equally and without reservation. All its creations have their own special place in the grand scheme of things without any preference or priorities. Long ago, the source created the universe in a burst of energy that expanded to fill the void. And it created individual aspects of itself so it could experience what it had created in all of its different facets. He told me that souls are one of its creations, and whatever we experience as souls is also experienced by the source. All the trials and tribulations that souls have encountered since they spun out from the source have been experienced by the source, and this allows it to relish the diversity of feelings and consciousness in the life forms it created. 
All souls, which includes everyone here today, are individual aspects of the source who were created to explore the universe in order to grow and evolve. Because each soul determines its own path for evolution and the things it chooses to experience, all soul journeys are different. Thus, all souls are unique in their own special way. But the source does not make any rules or guidelines for souls to follow. Whatever you do during your incarnations in the physical world or as a being of energy in the spirit realm is neither good nor bad. It just is what it is. The source has no expectations of you and you cannot anger or disappoint the source because everything you do is an expression of the sublime diversity created by the source, a divine melange of energy, vibration, and consciousness. Our purpose is to grow and evolve to fulfill our destiny as divine creations of the source. We will continue to move onwards and upwards because that is the only direction we can go. Just as an acorn is destined to grow into an oak tree, we are destined to advance on a path of evolution without a finish line. And because the universe is constantly changing and expanding, we are on a never-ending journey of exploration and growth designed to help us become more like the source with each advance that we make. Those, my friends, were a few highlights from my astral journeys with Albert. Time does not permit me to discuss all of these out-of-body trips, but the details are set out in full in my books. Albert designed these trips to teach me and all humanity a lesson or provide us with nuggets of wisdom. It is Albert's desire for everyone to understand the complexity of life in our universe so we can better understand the cycle of life on Earth. Albert's goal is to help us curtail our negative emotions so we can fully embrace love and compassion for one another, for Mother Earth, and for all the other creatures who share our planet. All of my books are available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook format. They can be purchased from my publisher, all the popular online bookstores, and many bricks and mortar stores. Convenient buy links and more information about my books can be found on my website, which is garnetschulhauser.com. Now we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone would like to ask a question, please come up to the microphone and I'll do my best to answer them. You mentioned that um Sometimes windows from another dimension open and some people can detect events from them, which is the Mandela effect. Did Albert by any chance explain why some people can detect these events from other parallel, parallel universes and others can't? He just said it's random, random events. Like sometimes these windows just open up. Uh, it's a random sort of occurrence. Could be any country, any place. And if you happen to be there at the right time, you can peer into the other dimension. But it's not, it's not organized by anyone. It just happens, just sort of the interaction of uh, matter and energy in our universe. Thank you. Uh, Garnet, I have, I have two questions. Please okay. forgive me, I have two. Um, first, would, would Albert consider adopting me? <laughs> I, I'm sure he would, Bob. I'll ask him the next time I speak to him. Uh, please, uh, that's, that's a real question. Um, number two. Anybody else? <laughs> number two, um, how is it that you contained, uh, I mean, Tell us a little bit about how difficult it had to have been to contain who you really are in all those years you were lawyering and you couldn't let this out. I mean, how, how did you do that? Well, actually, it didn't really happen, Bob, until, until I met Albert. Before that, I was just a typical uh, button-down, stuffed shirt corporate lawyer. And I wasn't religious or spiritual. In fact, I didn't even know what a spirit guide was. And so it didn't, it didn't happen until I actually bumped into Albert as a homeless man, and all of a sudden my life was just transformed. It's like, okay, he opened up my eyes. And, and, and since then, it's been totally different. So you, be, you were gifted with Albert after you retired? No, no actually, a, a, a year before. I met Albert in 2007, um, and, and then a year later I retired. And I retired because it just seemed, after talking to Albert, practicing law just seemed to be irrelevant. So I had to get out of it. 
Well, you kind of answered it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you for your talk. And I, I, I've read all four of your books, and I've really enjoyed thank them. You. Is there going to be a fifth book? I'm halfway through the manuscript for book five. Excellent, excellent. And do you still have contact with Albert every day? Not every day. I occasionally, just whenever I have a question or when he wants to tell me to do something, it happens, but it's not every day. So what were the answers to those three questions? Why are we here? Who am I? What's my purpose? Okay, so who am I? Well, I'm an eternal soul, just like you are and everyone else here. Why am I here? Because I chose to come here. I was a, a, a being of energy on the spirit side. I chose to incarnate on Earth, one of the planets on the denser physical plane because I wanted to experience things that you can't experience on the spirit side. So I wanted to, and, and I set myself up to uh, first challenges, learn lessons so I could grow and evolve. And so the question that, why am I here? When I asked myself that question every Monday morning when I looked at myself in the mirror as I'm shaving, the answer to that is I'm here because I chose to be here. And what is my purpose? My purpose is to try to grow and evolve, uh, face the challenges that I've put in, in front of myself or that happen randomly. Um, so that I could uh, grow and evolve as a soul. And the good news is, is that no matter what I did well on earth, um, even if I stray off the path I had hoped to follow, at the end of the day I always go back to the spirit side. And so really nothing to lose. It's sort of an adventure. And, and of course, then what happens to me when I die, I go back to the spirit side. And from there, I can decide to stay there. I can decide to incarnate back on earth or incarnate on another planet in a different life form. Totally up to me. No one forces me to do anything. It's, it's solely my decision, and, 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 and I, I know that once I get there, I'll have to make a decision. Do I want to come back here or not? I know many people have said to me, there's no way I'm coming back to this hellhole. But, and I've thought that myself many times, but the fact of the matter is, Albert says, when you're on the other side, you look at a, a life on Earth as much differently than you do here, because there is no linear time. A, a, a lifetime of 80 years on Earth is like a blink of an eye to the people on the spirit side. So it's like a very short little adventure. And so, you know what, if, if things don't go right, what the heck, I come back, I can do it over and over again until I feel I have it right. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, I can only take, sorry, just one more question because I'm out of time. I have a question about animals. Um, I have a farm in Hawaii and there are a lot of animals that people don't want, like mongoose. And um, I, I don't want them around there either, but I don't want to kill them either. And, and, but I was wondering about animals and, and, and if, do we, I know we want to protect them and everything, but can you tell me more about the purpose of having like rats and things that we don't like, nuisance animals? Are well, they all have their own, their own place on, on our planet. They, they have their own abilities and their own things that they do. And it's just a matter of, uh, we have so many creatures on our planet, but, but you know, it may seem strange to us, like why, did, why do we have rats or why do we have mongooses or whatever, but they all have their place. We don't understand that as humans. When we get back to the spirit side, we will understand that those animals actually have souls incarnated in them and they're, they're experiencing life on earth from the pr perspective of an animal. That's what was the question. Do they have souls like insects? Do they have souls? Ants, yeah, do yeah. they have souls? Yeah, yes. I, I, yeah, I remember when I, when I asked Albert the first time, do animals have souls? He said to me, you need only look into the eyes of your little dog to find your answer. <laughs>